So hello, uh, I'm Dale Jarvis. I'm the Intangible Cultural Heritage Development Officer for Heritage NL. And today I'm having a chat with the Newfoundland blacksmith, uh, Ian Gillies. Ian, do you want to introduce yourself? I think you did a pretty good job already. Yes, I have a day job, but I also work as, as a blacksmith. I have a forge, cold, traditional old forge. And um, not only do I make things, but I'm looking to preserve the history of blacksmithing in Newfoundland. So uh, where are you, you are, where are you based? You have two forges, I, I understand. Yeah, my main, my, really my forge is, is dedicated forges in Brigham South on the, on the southern shore. And uh, I have sold a lot of the things that I, the things that I do up there through the colony of Avalon. And I've done a, a bit of work with them. We kind of work together and hope to do more work together in the future when it comes to more the history and preserving of, of blacksmithing and demonstrating and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then you have a home forge in CBS, is that? Yeah, I have, uh, I have a garage and I do everything out in that garage like most people in Newfoundland. <laughs> yeah. Now I know you, you have had a, a long and winding road, so to speak, to, <laughs> <laughs> to, get, you, yeah. uh, to get you here. Um, you've had a kind of an interesting background. Do you, can you just talk a little bit about how you, how you got started uh, with an interest in this kind of stuff? Well, that would start about 10 years ago, I suppose. Yeah, the, the, I've had a major history before that. But that, this, the history with blacksmithing, I mean, I've, I've had experience doing electrical and carpentry and plumbing and everything before this. And, uh, but it just started out uh, as a single dad, me and my son out in the backyard um, at a fire and he was poking it and it got red hot and he was probably a little 10 or a little less, very big for his age. And he started, I told him you can hammer it on the rock if you want. And he started, I couldn't believe how he formed things right away. And I was like, oh, I didn't, I thought it would take more than that. So we started research. It, and I was telling my brother who lives away and he said, oh, I've been interested in that. And then we went, uh, you know, we started small at home, building small gas forges and trying different things. And then we all decided to meet my son and my brother and met at a blacksmith school and we took our first course in Nova Scotia. And then it just grew from there. My brother and I both tend towards the collecting of things that maybe we shouldn't collect. We had a an anvil collection. We drove halfway across the country and stopped at every metal place and picked up uh, every old tool that we get everything from anvils to leg vices and everything else. And it just kind of grew into not just blacksmithing and learning how to do it, but the history of it and, uh, and how to preserve it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm curious about the, uh, you talk about going off and doing the blacksmithing course. So where was, where was that? Uh, that was in Wicogama in Cape Breton was the first one. And um, then uh, I think it was the next one. We went, my brother, lucky enough, my brother lives in Italy, was living in Italy at the time. And we went to, uh, we were in, uh, up in Tuscany for a couple of weeks up there. Yeah, it was terrible. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, Black it Black sounds Black horrible. Black yeah. Black was also an artist and a great cook. So, and he would go pick up these major, whatever, 10 gallon crafts of, of wine each day. And yeah, we would imbibe. <laughs> so what kind of uh, what kind of skills uh, did you learn uh, kind of formally through a school setting as opposed to picking up? Yeah, the, the first one was that was a basic and everything from how to start the fire, how to stand, how to hold a hammer, and all of these things are, are really important. I mean, if you do blacksmithing, you're going to end up, you know, you'll have long term injuries if you don't know how to stand properly, hold a hammer properly, how to hammer properly. All the, these are things that you really should learn unless you're just a hobbyist. But if you're going to do it any amount of time, you really need to do that. And that was a lot of it, how to control the fire, what temperature the steel should be, you know, to do different things. You don't want it too hot for some things. You don't want it too cold for some things. That was the basic one at the beginning. And then uh, <clears throat> I had worked for a couple of years on my own and, you know, with other people learning where I could go and visit other blacksmiths. And then by the time we went, to, years later, we went and did the school in Italy. That was a tool making course. So how to make your hammer and how to, you know, using power hammers and, you know, so different stages as they needed. We went off and did different training. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it, I needed it all for sure. So can you, uh, your forge in Brigus South, can you, can you kind of walk me through it? Can you describe what it looks like and what's, what's in it? Well, luckily enough, it was my brother's property that he had bought. 
about 12 years ago. And uh, it was a couple from the States. It was her summer place. And uh, he made furniture and she was an artist. And they had a little shed that had a poured cement floor that they used as their artist studio. And it was so perfect for us. It was about the same time we got into the blacksmithing not soon after that. And it's ideal, it's a separate building with a view like you wouldn't believe, I literally a million dollar view in Brigus South. It's, a, it's just amazing. And uh, yeah, we started there, uh, built the forge there. And I have my bellows at home. I bring a lot of it at home at winter, in the winter time since there's no, nothing you know, it's as basic as you get up there. So I'm gonna, we're hoping uh, later this year, next year to build a stone forge up there. And you know, a lot of it is just as much for people to come by and visit and see how it all was and preserve the history as it is working, you know, we have different levels. Like I have a, you know, the old bellows and then I have a hand crank and then we have the electric blower. So, you know, hopefully we can display the process, the, the progression of, of blacksmithing, you know. And we collect people in the area They used to, we, we, when we bought the place, it was called, I can't remember the name of the hill, but uh, officially one of the documents. But then as we got to know people, they just called it uh, Forge Hill. And it now really is called Forge Hill because that we were almost on the exact spot, probably about 20 feet away from where the old forge was. So it's you know, amazing how it all worked out. And I've collected materials so people knew like, the anvil we have there was originally from a cove, a couple, there was, used to be a blacksmith cove a little further up the street, but now right next to that, it moved to King's, Kingman Cove. And uh, we initially, we got the anvil from there. We've been collecting tools and different work from the area and we just keep it at the forge for people to see when they come by. Mm -hmm. So we were talking before this interview just about how prevalent forges were at one point in, in yeah. Newfoundland. You know, they're, today there's something of an oddity and we think of them as being kind of, you know, something that happened in the distant past. But it wasn't that long ago that every community had multiple forges. Definitely. More forges than churches, I say. And we did. Yeah. And yeah. Definitely. And uh, Newfoundland blacksmiths, you know, uh, especially in the outports, did everything. You know, you go other places, major cities, they had the farrier and they had different work. But Newfoundland blacksmiths, <clears throat> one time of the year, they'd be doing horseshoes. Another time of the year, they'd be doing the, the rigging for the ships. Another time of year, they'd be doing farm equipment. And they would, uh, a lot of times, you know, keep metal, that whatever, and, and they'd be set up to do this particular thing certain times of the year. It wasn't just, you know, one time of the year. That, you know, I talk to the old people, they remember horses being lined up certain times of the year for the winter shoes or summer shoes and different things like that, you know, or farm equipment. So it was really a major industry that like the Newfoundland blacksmith, I mean, probably compared to a lot of other islands or outports were, you know, much different compared to a major city that did yeah. everything. Yeah. I remember I, I had done an interview with Bill Littlejohn in Coley's Point, Bay Roberts, and whose father and grandfather were blacksmiths. And he, he has memories of being a boy uh, and kind of being, uh beginning of winter and all the men would be out before dawn with their horses lined up to get their winter shoes uh put on and he and he has that very strong memory of the the sleigh bells and the lines of horses and then him having to go off and help do little jobs for his father or grandfather well, i talked to uh, one of the son of the blacksmith in kingman's cove and he said they would bring the horses and they would line them up once they shooed the horses they would just let them go People wouldn't wait around and the horses would just go home. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's quite amazing, really. But the forge is also a really community hub, you know, especially for the men back in the day. Um, so, you know, during the summer when there's people around, they do refer to it as a forge pub every now and then. We'll get together in the nighttime. <laughs> you know, nobody drinks in forges, of course, but, you know, people come by and demonstrate. Well, I'll hang out. It's still a really gathering place for people in the community when they see the door open. You know? I, I know in Cape Breton, there was a real association with the forge and uh, storytelling. Like it was, a, it was a spot where the men would gather and you'd get all the the news, but you know you'd be there all day and people would it would be the the storytelling performance space in Cape Breton. Right? Yeah, especially in the wintertime, you got such a heat source. People <laughs> are drawn to that. That's yeah. you know, and 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 you know, men are always interested in always, especially back in the day when you know what work was going on and learning different things. It's, it's the way everybody learned then. You know, there was no formal schooling. Just mm -hmm. went in, and a lot of people, like you're saying, they remember they go in and they take a turn at the bellows, you know, because the blacksmith get tired. That's a lot of kind of work that didn't get you anywhere. You know, the kids would come in, yeah, oh yeah, go ahead, pump the bellows. You know, yeah, a lot of fun so, memories people have. 
Yeah. So the, your your Brig of South Forge, it's a it is a coal forge. Yep. All yeah. Of, you know, all I've worked with is coal. Yeah. You said that you had had a gas forge, or one of your first kind of experiments was with a gas yeah, forge. Yeah. So just, what's uh, what's the difference then? Why is why is one better than the other? Uh, I, I actually have a, a well. First one was a maid. I used uh, fire bricks. You know the bricks that you use in a wood stove and drilled holes. Put my own gas hoses in and things like that, which was fine. And uh, uh, we do on our drive, our collection of anvils and tools, we did buy a gas forge, which I have never hooked up and I have never used. It sits <laughs> up in my garage, people think. But I don't know. I just, uh, I guess where I'm so more, I'm more interested in the history and learning and, and the basics and keeping that alive. But I really like working with the coal. Now, there has never been a coal mine in Newfoundland, as far as I know, and it's not easy to come by anymore. I had people calling me quite often and say, I got some old, and put the, whole, the co old coal from the home and I'll go by and collect it. In the beginning, I was, you know, going down in basements and grabbing garbage bag fulls of coal and going up the coal, old coal chutes and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's not easy to come by, uh, but I do, I, I just much rather work with the coal. I don't know. There's a, there's a real art to the coal and uh, especially this forge that we were at, at the school we went to over in Tuscany. I mean, this is a massive production. He's got like, five power hammers, a lot of, and they still just use coal. And but and he is an artist. This this the teacher over in Italy, and uh, there is an art to the coal, especially, you know, if you're in there in the dark. There's some uh, photographs I posted where um, uh, I can't, the History Channel, Italy History Channel, came by while we were there and took pictures. And the only light source was the fire. You know, it's some, some beautiful stuff, you know. And it really is just the art in itself using the coal. Hmm. I've heard this anecdotally, and I don't know if this is true. So maybe you can tell me if this is, you know, just an urban legend or if this is true. But I, I, I had heard at some point that one of the reasons why the forges were, were darker spaces was because uh, the blacksmith needed to really be able to gauge the color of the metal. Is that yeah. true? Yeah. Like I was saying, that was one of the first things I learned is the color of the metal. You know, people say something's red hot. They think it's really hot, but red is like, as soon as it turns red, that's when I stop hammering it because you're basically hammering cold steel when it gets red. You know, the, it's, it's the yellow and white hot that are really hot. And, uh, and, you, and you can, uh, you know, you, it really does different things to the steel. You know, if you, if you make it harder, you can make it more brittle. You can make it malleable depends on how you cool it it's got to get to a certain temperature before you cool it or do you let it cool slowly do you cool it fastly quickly you know there's different oh yeah it's a major thing the color but also in like as in my forge up at the shore is once you get that coal dust on everything the whole place is black it doesn't really <laughs> it's gonna uh, be dark anyway <laughs> yeah. the light doesn't really bounce around in there you know <laughs> much like my lungs <laughs> now uh, where do you get your materials you said it was difficult to get Coal. Where where do you get your coal? Where do you get your your iron or whatever it is you use? Yeah. Well, I actually like to recycle materials a lot. That's what I because um, the old iron is softer. Like as soon as you pick up a piece, of, you know, you pick up a piece of steel or iron. I can tell now, you know, how old it is within a certain range. And uh, the old wrought iron railings is one of the things I love to work with because that old wrought iron. It is just like Play-Doh. When you get that to a certain temperature, you can, uh, you know, it, it's, it probably sounds loud when someone's hammering on the anvil, especially if you miss, you get too thin or something. But it is, it's, it's like working with, with modeling clay when you, when you get the old wrought iron to a certain temperature. And the newer steel that I buy, I'll buy, you know, if someone's got a particular thing that they want me to do, but I, I love going around and finding a big chunk of old steel and seeing something and, and trying to make something out of that. You know, just different things to work with, different, you know, really, it really varies. If you don't know what steel you're working with, it can really vary as to what temperature you work with it and, and what you do with it. Tell me about your, um, your railway spikes. Yeah, those are, I uh, love working with those, much like the wrought iron, especially the older they get, the more malleable they are. And, uh, I do a lot of, most of the times I'll make knives out of them and they are, they do get a nice edge on them. You know, I, I harden the steel, but they're just as much a bit of Newfoundland history and a conversation piece 
as they are a functional knife, probably probably more so than a, than a functional knife. Um, and they are all old railway spikes, and they really they can really vary in size, and thickness, and length. But uh, so I have people contact me all the time, you know. So I've gotten hundreds at a time. And usually, it's on the old railway beds. They will have uh, people who own cabins will get the road graded every so often because it gets full of potholes, and they have to pull up the spikes because they'll puncture through quad wheels and things like that. So people contact me and say, "Hey, I got a hundred of these spikes. Do you want them?" But uh, I love the fact that it's a bit of Newfoundland history. I've made everything from them for, you know, from hooks to other things. But other people actually have contacted me, say their grandparents' house is burned down or they got a piece of steel from some place. And one, one I really loved was, uh, it was a fireplace grate and there was four grandchildren from this home. And they said, we all like to have something in our home. That, so I just took that, that and I made four different knives out of this one fire grate. And now they all have it on display at their house. So it's the only thing they have left from their grandparents' home from years ago. Can you, can you walk me through the process of uh, taking something like a, a grate or uh, an old railway spike and turning it into something useful? Like what, what, is, the, what is the full process that you would go through to, to do that? Making a knife, for example. A uh, knife out of the railway spike. Well, the first thing is is that they're obviously really rusty and in very different shapes. So I'll try and pick the best ones in the beginning to have. But once I, you know, get them to the temperature, it's amazing. If I if I were to just heat the spike, let it cool, and grind it, it would be shiny, brand new looking steel. You would not be able to really tell the difference. Um, so I'll uh, heat it up, and first thing I'll do is I'll stretch out the handle end which has to be done in a certain way at a certain temperature at a certain point on the anvil and you stretch out the steel and then I'll twist that but I won't quench it till I let it cool so you still have to hold it by the tongs when I turn it around to do the blade end which since the end of the spike is kind of the bulbous end you need to have a certain tongs to hold it with so you have to make tongs that's why you see blacksmiths with so many different types of tongs or if you look at an old forge you can tell what kind of work they did by the tongs and different tools they had because you had to make something for every job you did. So I'll use the particular tongs that hold the head of the spike and then I'll again draw out the blade with the uh, hammer and heat and that has to be at a certain temperature because when you're going to go to harden the blade it needs to be up to a, a fairly high temperature before you start burning the carbon that's left in the steel out of it and then it needs to be cooled quickly. So I'll shape the blade and, and hammer that to as close as I want to the finished product without getting too thin because it will crack if I quench it. So then I'll try and heat the edge of the blade more so than the, the spine of the, the blade and uh, get it to the right temperature up to about a yellow. And then I'll quench that quickly. Now that's a really thick blade so I can quench it in water. If I was gonna do like a bladesmith does, people who do just blades, they'll probably quench in oil or something different. They do, they'll do. they have a different process than what I do. And uh, and then I go with uh, everything from grinders and files and shape it down and, and uh, then sharpen it. I have everything from files to sandpaper to stones that go from 800 grit to 6,000 grit down to what it feels like a polished, it almost feels like a polished uh, ceramic mug. It's so fine when you put the edge on. But like, and, and then I'll, I'll have a finished product with that. But compared to what I do, compared to what a bladesmith does, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's a completely different product or a process to a lot of, a lot of bladesmiths. They'll actually go out and buy the steel, which I haven't really looked for, but I don't know if you can get it around here, the particular steel with a certain percentage of carbon and you can buy it to the thickness of a blade and you don't really have to hammer it out. You can cut it out and grind it and shape it. <clears throat> So the process that I do to make a knife is probably very different than what an actual blade smith will do to, to make a knife. Yeah. So when you're when you're looking at uh, something you've created, so if you if you've created a a, a knife, in your in your head when you're looking at it, what how do you know if you if it's good or bad for you? Like what what makes a good knife in your estimation when you're done? And it's funny because I've had ones that I've put aside and I said, well, no, I don't like that. And someone will come by and go, oh, I like that. That's what I want. Well, I, didn't finish it. I can finish it if you want it. But, so it really is a matter of taste. You know, I have a couple of different shapes. 
I've done other things and people ask me, can you make a cheese knife? And then I think about my own cheese knife. You know, if, if the blade is too thick, it'll stick to the cheese you're trying to cut through. And so I've done them where they're long and straight. And then I realize, what well, if it's long and straight, my hand hits the board before the blade hits the bottom of the cheese. So then I make it with a different shape with a little hook on it. And so, but I guess it all depends on the purpose, but a lot of the times it is just a matter of um, pleasing to the eye. Like I have a particular shape that I like, and that's what I, I do most, but I'm sure as a matter of opinion, someone probably doesn't like it, you know? Yeah. But I could, I could change them too, you know, people send me a picture of something that they want, I go, oh yeah, sure, I could copy that. So how, that. How, how often do you do that kind of work, that kind of uh, custom uh, one-off kind of design I stuff? Most. I, don't, I don't do that much, but that's what I enjoy most. Um, it's hard to say, you know, I guess it's more the time of year when it comes into Christmas or, Mother's Day and things like that is when, I, um, you know, people come up on my site and ask me to do something custom. And uh, yeah, that's what I much. That's what I'd rather do. I, 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 I'm much more about the art and making a piece of art. You know, I'm working on a, well, probably too many things at once out there, and I'll go out and what I got. There's one thing I'm making is a is an, a codfish skeleton. So whenever I get a bit of time, I get the forge going. I go, oh, maybe I'll do another one of these or another one of that. A couple of different jobs that I'm doing out there. I don't know when they'll get done. I've started. Uh, I have this pitcher plant that I really like making in Newfoundland. And my ideal is to make a whole line of Newfoundland flowers out of steel. So flowers that grow in Newfoundland. But every time I get one done, someone orders it, and I end up selling that one. <laughs> so uh, I don't know when I'll ever get that done. But that's the idea that I like. You know, just just creating things like that. Yeah. You mentioned uh, at the beginning the colony of Avalon, which is the the Fairyland archaeological site there. Um, I know you've done a, a few things like uh, making square nails so to demonstrate and, and that kind of thing. Can, can you just talk about how that that history and archaeology influences your your work? Yeah, actually, in another life, I probably would have been an archaeologist. So that's that's probably what I do really love the most out of all of it. And the, the and I love the being connected with them in that way, in in and history, but uh, yeah, I guess I had connected with them and they were showing me what they had found in the ground around the forge, what some people would call um, uh, slag, but it's actually you know they thought it was like the the cast off of the steel, but when I look at it, it's it's the clinker, which is actually the cast off from the coal. And you'll find it in dirt. And if you're digging for a forge, obviously these things is what you will find wherever there was a forge. And uh, the square nails are uh, interesting in the fact that they get, show me some of what they had. And I clean them up and you, they're usable again. They could be 400 years old. And I clean them up and you can use them again, which is amazing. But I would recreate the same nail. And I guess you can put them in any situation, you can stick them in a French bench post, throw one in the water, dig one in the dirt, and after you pull them up after 10 years, then you could date and say, oh, this is what happens to this, you know, if I'm using the, the right kind of steel, this is what happens to it. And you can actually, if you dig one up, you could almost date it just by looking at it, see, okay, if it's in this type of soil or it's in this type of water for this, to get looking like this, it must have been this long, how long it's been here. Mm -hmm. But also, um, there's cut square nails and then there's hammered square nails and they look very different to a cut square nail. Um, you'll see it's a lot of times they're just kind of tipped over at the top, all the weights off to one side, but the head of the nail, but the older hand hammered square nails, a lot of times they'll call them a rose head and you can see how the hammer hit it in four different shapes and flattened it out and different things like that. So you can really, it's amazing what you can date or tell what was made by the type of nail you found, you know, if it was a house or if it was whatever, it might've been used on a boat, but a lot of times on boats, they, they, you would have used wooden pegs and things. So you can tell where on a boat, it wouldn't have probably been exposed to the salt water as much or different things like that. Just it, it, to me, it's a, what I've learned by, you know, talking to them, it's, it's amazing what you can learn by uh, looking at the progress of how something has deteriorated over the years or what was there, you know, just by yeah. finding a nail. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what year it would have opened, but uh, but eventually in St. John's there was the, the a nail foundry that was that was that built, was. and and they started kind of mass producing nails. Um, so I'm guessing that for kind of the urban market, uh, 
that must have had a, a, an impact on the number of forges or, or that kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. They were probably cut. Yeah, cut like cut wire nails, I guess, yeah. more than than yeah. hammered nails. But but you know there were there were forges that that really uh, lasted. Like um, they're on Lime Cody. Street in St. John's Cody's Metalworks. Like they're they've been there for. They still have the coal forge in there. I was in there one day, and and uh, Mr. Cody took me around. You know they haven't turned it on in a long time, but it, you know the remnants of it is still there. Yeah. What what do you think was the what do you think was kind of the the straw that broke the camel's back? Like, what, where, when do you think that the the rural blacksmith started to fade out? I don't know. I suppose when they got the the the, the roads in more, you know. I I'd say I don't know how common they were. Well, even the one in in, in you know I know guys my age, you know guys who are fifty years old that remember going to the forge. And pumping the bellows up in Brigus, and that's you know forty five minutes out of town. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it, depending on the urban area, you know, I'd say it probably went slowed down much quicker in St. John's than it did in the in, in the outports, because like I said, that's only uh, you know fifty years, you know, forty years ago, one generation that there were yeah. still forges in most communities around. So it's amazing how they've how they've gone the wayside so quickly. You know? Yeah, yeah. I know, um, talking to Mr. Littlejohn in Coley's Point, like, he said at a certain point when everyone started having trucks, you know, yeah. instead of horses, like that made an impact. But then he said his father's work kind of shifted a bit because uh, people would um, would buy a truck, but then his father would make, you know, the, the boxes for the back or whatever it was. And, and there was still a need for things like shovels and picks and things yeah. like that. So they were still making tools but the work really had had changed and i and i guess at a certain point people didn't maybe need um as many grapnels or inshore fishery related tools as much as they once did yeah definitely and it's funny you know uh, uh it's funny you say grapnel it's grapple and grapple and grapnel you know you hear this all <laughs> yeah it'll say something different you know but it all means the same thing and you'll see them uh, later on, they were just rebar that was bent and twisted, and you can tell um, where they've been welded by machine or forge welded, and that is a big indicator. So that's what I'll do. I'll go around and look at the old anchors, and you'll see the hole, the head at the top of the anchor. You can tell if it, it has been heated, and then a chisel went in to split it, and then a, you know you had something that that stretched the hole out, and it was done in a forge, uh, and uh, compared to it was poured that way or however else they do it in modern times but i've seen a lot of the older anchors that were uh you could tell were hand forged but yet they got machine welded uh you know rebar or something on the end of them so you can actually tell you know how the time how old it was and it's been used for so many years and how it's changed over time that's pretty interesting and but the forge to make a, a, an anchor would have been you know much bigger than the average forge how uh, how healthy do you think the tradition is today? It seems to be coming back. I mean, there, I hear I hear from people all the time that have forges going on now. I don't. I have never seen another one here in you know around. But lots of guys are forging. You know, but I don't know if they have gas forges or what they are. But there's different groups and guys out there sharing the work and and doing it. I think it's coming back more than much like the other things. You know. The arts people are just realizing that this is being lost and are starting to trend that way again you know you know it's definitely a lost art you know and it's a shame to lose that history i mean it's such a major major part of our history in an outport especially you know outport newfoundland like how could well not in, you know, even in st john's there was a ton of them but you couldn't have existed. You know, it could have existed without the church, but you couldn't exist without the, uh, without the forge. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so now if people are interested in uh, seeing some of the stuff that you've done or following you, I know you're on social media. What's the best way for people to kind of look at your work? Yeah, probably just go to Newfoundland Blacksmith on Facebook because I don't have, people want to come by the forge all the time and I'm not there any set times. There are tour groups that will actually come by when they think I might be there on the weekends and things like that. But uh, yeah, if, if the door is open, come on in, you know, up, up in Brigus South. But 
yeah, to see my work or to message me or ask any questions. I help people all the time. They have questions about what they want to do with blacksmithing. I've even offered, I've gone to small communities and I've gone and I've seen the forge. It was up, up the shore from you, up hearts, delight, hearts, content up there somewhere. They have a little forge. I said, I'm willing to come by for nothing for a weekend and set this up for you if you want to have a functioning forge again. You know, so if people want, if they have a forge and they, uh, uh, you know, especially for historical reasons, they want it set up again or, or help with it, I'd be more than happy to, to do that kind of thing. Yeah, well, we might have to have a further chat about that. I, 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 yeah. And I know exactly the forge you're talking about. It's Hearts Content. It's right on the, right on the road. Yeah. Uh, just on the curve, uh, heading north out of the community, yeah. and I told them, I gave them my number. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give them a poke, and we'll uh, yeah. we'll see. Because I think we're going to be doing some work along the Bakaloo Trail. So yeah, it would be nice to have have more of this stuff uh, happening. Now, uh, before we end, I got to ask one question: yeah. um, the kilt. Mm -hmm. Tell me yeah. about the the kilt. <laughs> I, I look for any excuse to wear my kilt. My family, my, my great grandfather came over from Scotland. I have a bunch of them, but I have one black kilt that I use just when I'm in the forge. But uh, my, now my son has my, my father's kilt. But uh, oh yeah, I look for any excuse to wear my kilt. <laughs> So you can go on, you can go on Facebook and see the, the photos of the kilted blacksmith uh, right yeah. there. All right. Thanks for this, Ian. Thank you. Appreciate your interest.